Welcome to Horror Bubble. Today, we're thrilled to present a tale by US author Gregor Zane. The story is a work of weird fiction, penned in Zane's unique, masterful style, based loosely on the little known and exceedingly short Grimm's fairy tale Noist and His Three Sons, which we will read as a prelude to the story. Be sure to visit the video description below for links to Zane's work. Noist and His Three Sons Between Vale and Zoist, there lived a man whose name was Noist, and he had three sons. One was blind, the other lame, and the third stark naked. Once they were walking across a field, where they saw a hare. The blind one shot it, the lame one caught it, and the naked one put it in his pocket. Then they came to a tremendously large body of water, on which there were three ships. One leaked, one sank, the third had no bottom in it. All three got into the one with no bottom. Then they came to a tremendously large forest, in which there was a tremendously large tree. In the tree was a tremendously large chapel. In the chapel was a sexton of hornbeam wood, and a parson of boxwood, who were passing out holy water with cudgels. Blessed is he who from this holy water can flee. I Will Tell You About Noist, by Gregor Zane We didn't believe in fairies until the morning we all awoke, to find their corpses scattered everywhere but the story of their lives and their relationship to ours became known within days. Our kings had waged a secret war with the creatures for centuries. However, it was a low-ranking advisor to the crown who ultimately discovered their weakness and took decisive action. Very little is known of our kingdom's hero, even his name has been lost to history. But his detailed personal journals revealed that he was methodical, deliberately slow in his preparations. But what exactly he prepared, no one knows. Of course, the basic ingredients were discovered, every merchant listed in his ledger was mercilessly interrogated, but how they were combined was forever lost with him, on the night he killed them all. Yes, he too died in his tiny laboratory on that very night. The fire used to unleash the fairy play consumed him, his home, and, it is believed, his most cleverly guarded alchemical writings, all but a single sewing pattern for a stuffed idol, which resembled the physiology most common amongst the fairies. It was something out of our childhood bedtime stories, where effigies were powerful magic. Some say our saviour, tragically ignorant of his fairy heritage, was a half-breed, and accidentally committed suicide that night when he threw his inadvertent totem to the flames. That fateful night is now known as the Night of the Black Fog. Eyewitness accounts tell of a great pillar of smoke rising into a darkened sky. All manner of bizarre creature was said to be seen thrashing within its billows. Some tell that it resolved at its apex to form a great five-fingered talon that reached up to wipe away the moon and the stars. Ash dropped like a blanket of black wool to cover the entire kingdom, where it was pulled apart in great tufts by tree limbs and chimneys to carpet the land in darkness, to fill in every crack with rough shadow. Then the shrieks and screams began, as the black clouds' poison settled into the nooks and crannies where the fairies lived, the crawl spaces, the attics, the hollow trees, and into the vast network of underground dwellings that had mirrored our own, to extinguish a hidden enemy the common man would only come to know, after their collective demise. The fairies clawed from their holes in the hundreds of thousands, choking and crying in the night, to be found dead the next morning, covering streets and farms, hanging from trees, and spoiling gardens. Their shapes were strange and varied, as if they weren't of a common race, but a collective of beasts representing a hundred tribes evolved along different paths in wildly divergent environments, lands isolated from one another, but equally severe. 
To me, there seems no other way to explain these things. Lizards with freckled flesh as smooth as that of a human child's, fat mustachioed insects with huge frog-like mouths set in expressions of perpetual glee, scaly felines with naked monkey faces framed in bony ridges that resembled a lion's mane, worms that terminated in porcine snouts at both ends, feathered stick men with translucent beaks and wispy vestigial wings, spotted slugs, slimy masses of jumbled eyes and earholes, mouths and nostrils that threatened to burst forth from just beneath the surface of their gelatinous skins, legions of diminutive rodents having enormous moth's wings, their tiny fists clutching toothpick spears and flower petal bows, even in death, squat, six-legged humanoids dressed in what appeared to be ceremonial armor of exquisitely detailed and grand design that turned out to be things half-scarab, clothed only in their natural chitin. Their seemingly endless variety would one day be catalogued by yet another little thought of man, a man who would rise from obscurity to relieve the kingdom of its carpet of rot. His name was Herbert Noist. Between Verl and Zoist, Herbert Noist manned a crematorium, as his father had before him. He'd spent his life travelling from town to town, to battle sites along the kingdom's edge, to collect the dead. And, as is our tradition, he incinerated the remains and scattered them, mixing ash with sand along the beaches of the great ocean that laps against our nation's southernmost shore, an offering to the tides that are said to have birthed our primordial kin so long ago, waters once believed capable of raising the dead. Herbert Noist, a light sleeper who had somehow slept through the chaos of the black fog, followed his usual routine the next morning. He'd had his tea and eggs, and was well rested when he walked from his home, to find the dead abominations littered across acres of valueless wasteland that he still thought of as the family farm. Herbert, a man who rarely smiled, displayed all his crooked teeth just then as he recognized that he was one of few men alive who could wake up, prepared to profit amid fields and fields of death and decay. He was only minimally affected by the bizarre anatomy of the dead, as he was accustomed to the aftermath of violence, which makes all anatomies twisted and wrong. He woke his three sons, sent the eldest to scout the immediate environs and nearby villages, to see how widespread was the problem and set the other two boys to work, loading carts and hauling the remains to the crematorium. When the eldest son returned to report that the fairy bodies were littered throughout every town and field, and that they were rumoured to blanket the entire kingdom, his younger brothers were just then loading the last of the bodies into the furnace. His father was proud to learn that his favoured son had also returned, with several lucrative contracts to dispose of the dead. The next day, the younger sons were sent out to enlist their unemployed cousins and uncles to help man the expansion of the family business. A fleet of corpse carts was built to meet the demand. Herbert and his eldest boy worked tirelessly to secure more contracts, and soon the crematorium was running day and night. An endless column of black smoke unfurled into the sky. It wasn't long before the efficiency of Noist's operation became known to the king, and he was officially charged with ridding the entire kingdom of the fairy corpses. An official decree was issued that placed all crematoriums under his direction, and, with an influx of royal funds, new facilities were quickly constructed. The Noist family, although never poor due to the consistent nature of their business, had always understood the value of money. The frugality in their blood was not thinned by their newfound wealth. The youngest boy, Vance, was in charge of the livestock, and had been cutting the chicken feed with sawdust for years, to save money. It would have been a great sin to supplement the animal's diet with the ashes of human corpses, and the thought of mixing burnt remains with dried oats and ground corn had never occurred to him, until he'd returned from Vrilmont Gorge where he dumped what seemed like the thousandth cartload of the fairy ash 
for it would be sacrilege to scatter the beaches with inhuman remains. There were no laws, spiritual or secular, governing the disposal of fairy ashes, at least none of which he was aware. So it was with little worry that he began pouring the almost crystalline blue ash that the burning of the fairy corpses left behind into the troughs and feed bags. Three days after this practice began, Vance entered the barn to release the livestock into the fields, and found the styes and stalls were empty. He at first suspected thievery, and turned to run to report it to his father, but a loud thud stopped him. He walked toward the source of the noise, and peeked over the wall where he'd stowed the pigs, and found a fresh pile of shit still steaming on just the other side of the gate. Then he heard another thud, and turned to find another fresh pile a few feet away. It was then that Vance looked up, and found all the family livestock pressed against the rafters. Their strange silence, and their bulging eyes, caused him at first to think they'd all been hanged in the night. But then he saw legs move, and heard low neighs and snorts and whines, and realized that they were all still very much alive, but paralyzed with fear. Vance retrieved his father and his brothers, and showed them the dark magic at work. His sons were frightened, but Herbert's mind seized on practical matters, and he was soon directing them to fetch ladders and rope. They spent the better part of the morning hauling the animals from the air, and tying them to posts and the slats in their stalls, to keep them grounded. Their work done, they left the barn and closed the doors behind them, but before they could return to their daily tasks, they heard a squeal, almost like the voice of a panicked child, then a crackly thump. They opened the barn doors, and found the broken body of a young piglet. They guessed that the poor creature must have been tucked out of sight in a cubby in the rafters, and that when the spell was lifted, it fell to its death. Herbert, never a wasteful sort, would advance to bleed and butcher the pig right away. He then took a tour of the barn, and saw that some animals still strained at their tethers, floating an inch or two from the dirt floor, while others had all four hooves on the ground. He searched for hex marks and ciphers spelled out in rat bones, any signs of black magic, but found nothing. Herbert scowled at the beasts, as if they were laughing at him, and left the barn, to attend to the day that was quickly getting behind him. Three nights later, after finishing a meal of pork and greens and mashed tubers, Herbert excused himself from the table, lost his footing, and fell. He'd not been able to feel the floor beneath his feet. The sensation was startling, and he tipped over his chair. His back never hit the floorboards. His mind locked in anticipation of an impact that never came. He turned his head to the side, and saw yellow eyes staring at him. It was a white tom without a name, just a rat-catcher that his sons thought of as a pet. The cat stepped closer, nudged Herbert's shoulder, and passed under him, rubbing its back along his shoulder-blades as it went. There was nothing between Herbert and the floor. He watched the cat strut from the room, and looked up to find his three sons staring down at him, asking him if he was all right. But he didn't hear their words, not really. They hovered over him, legs outstretched, heels kicking the air, their bodies parallel to the floor. "'I'm sorry,' Vance said, tears dripping straight down from his eyes. "'Why, you sorry, son? I, I mix their ashes with the feed.' These words had trouble making it past Vance's trembling lips. "'You to whip me good, I know.' "'Just as soon as I'm able,' Herbert Noyce said. "'I promise you that.' He smiled and I'm certain Vance didn't like the look of that rare smile. Not at all. But Herbert wasn't thinking about taking a strap to his son's bare backside. He was formulating a recipe for a magic elixir. As soon as the effects of the ingested, tainted pork wore off, Herbert set the boys to work. He didn't give them time to tend to the cuts and scrapes they'd suffered when they'd crashed down up the floor. He sent the oldest son to purchase a barrel of mead, and his second oldest to fetch a bucket of fairy ashes. While he waited for their return, 
he kept his promise to his youngest child and striped his ass with blood. Herbert spent weeks mixing different ingredients, testing the results on his sons in turn, until he arrived at a combination that had just the right flavor and provided the proper amount of lift. The final product tasted sweet, with just the slightest bite of the medicinal, and would send the drinker floating approximately four feet off the ground, just high enough for a sense of wonderment, but not so high as to cause serious injury when its effects wore off, which they did without warning. The amount of ash seemed to only control the length of time and the height of suspension, and once their guts burned away the last bit, they dropped like game pigeons with bellies full of shot. Vance and two cousins were sent out in a corpse cart, refitted to carry hundreds of tiny bottles bearing the label of Noist's levitating elixir, and in less than a day the cart came back empty, save for a bulging bag of coin. Noist's elixir became a phenomenon, and dozens more carts were sent out to meet the demand. And, as one might have predicted, Noist's customers began consuming many bottles more than the recommended dosage, to achieve new and greater heights. One couldn't go to a crowded market in any town square without seeing bodies floating above the throng. Street performers hovered and juggled, acrobats performed aerial feats at the ends of strings, priests delivered sermons with feet dangling over the heads of their congregations, the king's army intimidated their enemies with flying archers. Never in the kingdom's history, not in the seasons of its most bountiful harvests, not even when its sons returned from great military victories, had such a sense of jubilation filled the hearts of every man, woman, and child, in every city, town, and hovel within its borders. The fairy wars were over, the corpses cleaned from the streets, and now the people were rising into the sky to rejoice. Herbert's wealth grew rapidly, and, as is often the case when youth and the power that money affords are combined, his sons became overindulgent and reckless. The eldest son, Richard, had a passion for women that soon transformed into an obsession. The precise number of young ladies he wooed with his innate charms, his newfound wealth, and his family's elixir is not known. The stories told in taverns and confessed in the darkness of our temples tell of hundreds of virgins sacrificed to his lust. This doesn't seem to be too great an exaggeration, considering the dozens of bastards born in a fifty-mile radius of his family home, who eventually grew to display the same distinctive features the young ladies had found so striking, a dimpled chin and two perfect rows of straight, white teeth. So it came as no surprise that it was during the culmination of one such seduction that this young man tragically met his end. His body was joined with that of the daughter of a prominent haberdasher, suspended above a mound of hay, piled high on the barn's floor, to break their fall. To hear his father tell it, with equal parts pride and envy, this was a stunt that Richard had pulled off successfully without injury many, many times before. Although there were no witnesses inside the barn, their bodies fell into the mound of hay as planned, as it is so romantically retold, during the peak of their ecstasy, but not before poor Richard's skull split on the railing that ran the length of the barn's loft. The haberdasher's daughter landed in the hay, with a dead man clenched between her legs. When her father came to collect her, she was curled up at Herbert's feet, body twisted in shame and anguish, still naked next to her lover's corpse. It's said that the haberdasher's face showed no emotion as he looked down on his only child. He didn't raise his voice or call out with rage when he took up a shovel and, without hesitation, brought its blade down on the girl's forehead. After throwing the shovel aside, and clapping some imaginary dirt from his hands, he turned to Herbert Noist and said, as if commenting on faraway events concerning people he'd never known, It is a horrible tragedy that these younger lopers both died from the fall on their wedding night. I'll be collecting the bride price in the morning. Within a few weeks, Noist's second oldest, Marcus, too, was dead. 
He'd been at the Golden Cliffs, where for generations girls and boys jumped into the great lapping waters below. But Noist's elixir had since enhanced these adventures, and they now floated over the ocean, playing games of tag and performing acrobatics, until the elixir's effects wore off and they were dropped laughing and screaming into the waves. Marcus had taken two doses before floating off the cliff, but drank three more while suspended. He floated up and up, until his comrades could barely see his pale flesh against the bright clouds. His friends fell, and swam to shore, peered up at him from the sands, hands shielding the sun from their eyes, for what seemed like hours. Then Marcus Noist fell, and his body shattered against a wall of unyielding salt water. His friends swam out for him, but were unable to find him. A search party of fishermen was soon organized, but Marcus's body was not found until a week after the search was called off. A young girl, not yet in her seventh year, found Marcus on the beach while collecting seashells. She still has nightmares to this day of the seagull feasting on his eyes. Then Vance, Noist's youngest, disappeared into the woods the night after Marcus's ashes were spread along the seashore. He drank alternating bottles of the elixir and an exceedingly strong brandy, and floated high into the darkened sky over the treetops. When finally he fell, the trees helped to break his fall, and the pliability of his drunken body protected him from mortal injury, but not from a broken spine. When he woke in the underbrush at dawn, his awful screams drew his father to him. The boy's legs, although devoid of broken bones or even cuts and scrapes, were now useless. And, although newly crippled, he spent the next few weeks accompanying his cousins on their travels from town to town, riding in the back of a cart filled with elixir, exchanging the tiny bottles for coin, offering slurred appreciations everywhere they went. Then, outside a small fishing village at the edge of the kingdom, after his cousins bedded down for the night, Vance made a second attempt at taking his own life. He left fifteen empty bottles of the elixir behind, along with a goodbye note scrawled in a drunken hand. His body was never found. Herbert Noyce told me these stories of how his children died as I attended him and the same blood cough that took his wife so many years ago. I administered the powders to help him sleep, emptied his chamber pot, and kept him filled with fluids, which seemed only to help replenish his supply of tears. He knew, as he lay there dying, that the elixir had brought tragedy to families throughout the kingdom, not just his own. He knew that the prolonged use of his elixir eventually brought on a chronic state of levitation, and that the land became overrun with floating invalids. He knew that sons and daughters were sneaking into their parents' bedrooms in the middle of the night, cutting their tethers, and setting them free through open windows, because they could no longer afford to feed them. He knew that his cousins, still managing his crematoriums, had a steady flow of business in burning the fallen. What he did not know, what he couldn't have known, on that autumn evening that smelled of smoke, lime, and roasted meat, when the final cough took him, when his last spoken words were taken from him in a burst of gurgling red, were the tales yet to be told of creatures crawling from the sea on furry insectile legs, of worms with porcine faces at both ends, burrowing through the beaches, of monsters bursting from the waves, borne up with great moth-like wings spraying the air, of canine mouths and mandibles stretched wide with ululating songs of rebirth, and revenge. <laughs>